Hello, friends and seekers, and thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Seeker Podcast. Before I start this week's show, I have an important message from my friend and Sixth Sense Media co-founder, Ray Davis. It's about four or five minutes in duration. Please listen to what he has to say, and we'll get on with the show. Thanks. Hey, guys. It's Ray Davis with Sixth Sense Media here with news with a different view. Today, I want to talk to you about the mainstream narrative. What I'm calling the mainstream narrative is a consensus reality that spans just about every topic you can think of, from science to economics to war and peace. It's the view of the world that you see promoted 24-7 on cable news networks and protected now by social media companies trying to limit the speech of people on their platforms. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Dennis and I talked about the banning of Alex Jones on the Seeker podcast, but this week I saw something even more sad happen. I happened to come across a couple of videos of channels that I have watched for quite some time. As I've shared with you before, I have a tendency to kind of watch and listen to things across the political spectrum because I want to get all different points of view and kind of triangulate on truth a little bit. And I happened to come across two channels that I have watched for some time, actually on opposite ends of the political spectrum, but both giving a truth in their message and their platform that is outside of that mainstream narrative. And they both happened to make a video that was very similar this past week. And in those videos, they basically shared their dejection, their frustration at the fact that despite the fact that they are giving well-researched facts and information, despite the fact that they have evidence for the things that they're talking about, no one seems to want to listen to alternative views. People seem addicted to this mainstream narrative. And it's really odd when you consider the track record of that narrative. That track record includes lying us into wars, misrepresenting all sorts of things to us constantly. And yet when someone comes along, right, left, or indifferent, with a different perspective, and with evidence to back up their perspective, people don't seem to want to listen. And both of these people had come to the same conclusion, that they're thinking seriously about or have decided to shut down their channels. They've decided it isn't worth it anymore to fight the battle of trying to get people to believe you and listen to you against a mainstream narrative that just seems to roll along like a drunk driver in the wrong lane with no consequences to the number of times that it has led us astray. And I was really saddened by the fact that both of these broadcasters had decided to stop doing their shows. And yet, I understand where they're coming from because I'd been fighting this fight for a long time too. And Dennis and I started Sixth Sense Media to be an alternative voice to try to share a different perspective on news and events and the paranormal and things like that in the world. And we felt the frustration as well. We feel like we're sharing good information. We're giving a different perspective, a thoughtful perspective. And at times it's frustrating because it feels like no one's paying any attention. And that's not us boohooing or these other broadcasters boohooing. It really is a major frustration that despite the fact the mainstream narrative has failed us so many times, it still gets all the traction. It still gets all the attention. It's still what people cling to. And so while I understand the frustration of these two broadcasters and I respect their decision that they're not going to invest their time anymore in trying to provide a different perspective to a world that doesn't seem interested in it. I'm here to tell you that I have not reached that point. In fact, I'm more determined than ever. You know, I get up every single day and I try to make my dent and I try to make it as positively as I possibly can. And there are real challenges in this world. There are real problems. We are on some very wrong tracks. And yet, I see the potential in humanity. I see the potential in each one of us and what we could be if we would be our best selves, if we could get out of these mainstream narratives and these paradigms that are holding us back, that are telling us we're limited, that are telling us our resources are limited, 
that are telling us we can't achieve what we want to achieve. I simply don't believe it. I won't believe it. And I won't stop working to help that vision win in this world. You know, I grew up watching Star Trek. And I realize it's just a science fiction series to a lot of people, but I always loved that vision of what humanity could be. And I've always clung to the idea that we are perfectly capable of reaching that level. Now, we're not going to do it if we keep holding on to this mainstream narrative that they're pitching us of one more war after another, justifying our trillion dollar military and intelligence budget, one more lie after another, one more way to divide us after another. If we keep listening to those voices, we will never get there. But if we start listening to alternative voices, people who have a different idea and a different vision for humanities today and tomorrow, then I believe we can reach any height that we set our minds to. So I refuse to give up. I'm going to keep pushing forward, even though I feel what they're feeling. I see people not listening to alternative voices who are offering a different perspective. The time has come, my friends. It's come to create a different world, a better world, a world that is worthy of our true potential. And I, for one, won't give up, and I won't give in, and I hope you won't either. This is Ray Davis with Sixth Sense Media. I hope you're having a great week, and I will talk to you again soon. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. But there's something wrong in the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Hello, friends, and welcome to The Seeker Podcast with Sixth Sense Media and Service of Change. It's the show that challenges reality, questions at which we've been taught in hopes of inspiring a new direction of thought to bring about change. We make the paranormal feel quite normal and the supernatural quite natural. Once again, that's exactly what we aim to do as we travel deeper down the rabbit hole of reality, exploring the false reality in this matrix that we believe we may exist within. Then again, maybe we don't. Tonight, we're going to talk about nanotechnology is it in our food is it in our bodies is it the trojan horse of ai waiting to emerge and take total control of our bodies and our minds bringing us into a new realm of enslavement like i said this one goes deep down the tinfoil hat is on probably three or four layers thick tonight as we talk about this that doesn't mean none of it's true that doesn't mean none of it's possible in the spirit of full disclosure on this show i'm going to piece together a lot of things Some of it I don't have a lot of strong evidence for, but again, it doesn't mean it's not worth exploring. Too many coincidences, too many things have come across across my plate that I have to piece this together. I have to talk about this on the air. I'm going to give you some homework assignments, some things to look into on your own and draw your own conclusions. Let me know if you think the pieces fit. This show, this episode has the potential to really scare you, and that's not my goal. That's why I want to give that disclosure at the beginning. I don't want to be one of those channels, one of those shows that just tells you the scary stuff because I don't have enough to say for sure that this is absolutely 100% true, but it's enough to at least talk about and hopefully get it out there to people who are smarter than me and have more resources than I do that can look into it. Before we do that, I just want to acknowledge the uh, the intro by Ray Davis this week, an important message that uh, Ray put out there, not giving up because he's right. You know, him and I did talk about it and I was, I was tempted to throw in the towel. Not that I want to give up, but I was just so frustrated and a little bit intimidated when they shut down Alex Jones. I know I've referenced that a few times on the show, but the show is still on the air. Uh, th- this is, this is big. You know, the show may not have the, uh, the attention that I hope that it would not yet anyway, but there's something important happening And that importance may just be to me personally in my own life. There I feel the need to express and share the information that I'm coming across with those of you out there who are willing to listen because you're on a similar journey. You're looking for information. You've looked at the world in front of you and you recognize that this isn't what I've been told. Something is wrong. It doesn't make sense. We're trying to find the answers. We're trying to hack the system. So we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about 
just this crazy reality that we live within. I have some news stories that I want to get into as well before we get into the nanotech. I received a newsletter from the To The Stars Academy with an article written by the one and only Louis Elizondo, the former counterintelligence agent working for the Pentagon for the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program now with To The Stars. Talked about him the other week as well with his uh, most recent uh, briefing that he gave to the people of MUFON. He wrote this article uh, dated September 4th, 2018. The article is titled, Why Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Are a National Security Risk and Also an Opportunity for Progress. So I'm going to read through some of this. Uh, I'm skipping the beginning here because uh, it's just not relevant to what I'm talking about. It's just an intro. I'll have the links. You can read the whole thing. I'm not skipping anything that I think is important or what I'm going to get into. Um, but he says here, when I headed the government's highly sensitive advanced aerospace threat identification program, or ATIP, I worked with the team to assess whether a particular chess piece, in this case in the form of an unfamiliar air technology, was a threat to our side of the chessboard. If it was, we had to know how to counter it. Since the government views unidentified aerial uh, phenomena as a potential national security issue, they're secretive by necessity. They don't want to reveal any information to a potential enemy. But there are risks to keeping that information classified. All right, so let's let's evaluate that for a minute. Why would they want to keep that information secret? From a security standpoint, you don't necessarily want the enemy to know what you know about the enemy because then the enemy can say, well, they know this about us, so we need to change our tactics. We need to change our equipment. We need to do something differently that they don't know so we can still hold the element of surprise. So I get that. I understand that. But as somebody who wants to know, I'm frustrated by it. And then he goes into some examples about, say, the person who, I'm going to paraphrase here, who learned how to harness fire and never shared it with the next generation, or the person who invented the telescope, threw it away when he was done using it, or the creator of the wheel decided it was too labor-intensive for others to build and decided to forget it. He goes on, as a species, we're meant to evolve, and we needed those advancements to get to where we are today. Reports of strange crafts with seemingly inexplicable properties have been circulating within the U.S. government for at least 70 years, which suggests it isn't going away. There is, quote, something out there. First of all, this is a pretty important statement in this paragraph. It seems minor. He's acknowledging that these reports have been coming through the U.S. government for 70 years. He's not saying what the reports were, but that brings us back. If it's 2018, that brings us back to 1948. That brings us back to the Roswell crash. Okay? So he's acknowledging, in, in my opinion, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this modern-day stuff, and I'm going to get into that in this show, starts with Roswell. And I can't stress enough how strongly my intuition resonates with this. Now, maybe I'm being misled and manipulated, but on this thread that I'm on, for whatever reason, keeps bringing me back to that era, to Roswell. Uh, it's just the, the the trail that I've been led down, so I'm going to continue to explore that. Because as of right now, I still trust my gut. So Elizondo goes on, declassifying certain information about UAP and sharing it with the public could lead to new technological discoveries, new forms of medical research, and a broader view of how humanity understands reality. Okay, so again, he, he's touching on this could change our view of reality, which is a big deal. That's a powerful statement. And he goes on, here's why. A government must assume anything is a threat until it has been proven otherwise. Well, that's what we've been conditioned to believe, and I understand street smarts, I understand, you know, this goes beyond street smarts, obviously, or maybe it doesn't. You want to be protective, and you do want somebody on your team who assumes everything is a threat, because you want them thinking to be able to defend you. But overall, as a total, you don't want your whole government with that mindset. That we're, that, that's where diplomacy goes out the window then. So I don't necessarily agree with that full statement. And he gives some examples here. When determining whether an unknown entity is a friend or foe, the U.S. government looks at factors including capabilities, intentions, vulnerabilities, and exploitability. A close look at these factors reveals just how little UAPs are understood. Advancements in our understanding of physics at the quantum level have helped shed faint light on the potential science behind UAPs. But these advancements have also shown that UAPs have superior technical knowledge as well. 
All right, again, he's packing a powerful punch in a tiny paragraph. And he's, this is what he told the people at MUFON, that we understand these things on the quantum level now. I'm not exactly sure fully what that means, but I, I broke that down, I think, two shows ago, um, what, he, what he shared of that. If these capabilities fell into the hands of a foreign adversary, it would be a decisive game changer. There's your fearful statement. Don't let the Russians get it because then we're going to lose control over this and they're going to kill us. Likewise, the intentions of UAPs haven't been made clear to us at this point. Be afraid. We don't know. They could be a threat. There could be a number of reasons for their presence, ranging from peaceful curiosity to a probe for battle space preparation. The possibilities are numerous. Now, I'm not going to be so arrogant as to say, you know, these things have to be peaceful. Uh, this is where I disagree with Dr. Greer because he says that, respectfully disagree, but he says, you know, with all this power and technology they have, they could destroy us in a nanosecond. Now, maybe they could. That's very possible. But there are other fates that are bad for us that don't have to deal with an Independence Day style destruction. We could be looking at an infection by a parasitic alien force that's using us the way we use cattle and sheep and whatever. So, and, and with what I'm going to get into tonight with nanotech and mind control and, and tying this into archons and AI and all that stuff, I, I think that's a, a very real possibility. Does that mean that everything that comes from outer space that's extraterrestrial is bad? No, we're not going to stereotype that way. We're not going to classify everything that way. We don't know enough. So I guess as much as I fully just want to disagree with some of the things Elizondo says, I don't know. He, now, he has more knowledge of this than me. Anyway, I, I digress. He continues, UAP vulnerabilities, however, remain a complete mystery. So what he's telling the world is that we don't know what their vulnerabilities are. Some have hypothesized that there's a correlation between UAPs and our nuclear capabilities, while others have suggested that nuclear-generated electromagnetic pulses are a potential weakness. Again, back to electromagnetism. In my research, everything is coming back to electromagnetism. That is so very important, whether you're dealing with consciousness, psychic capabilities, communications, everything comes back to the electromagnetic fields. I don't know that we necessarily don't know anything about it, but that's what he's putting out there for the enemy to believe that that's what he understands. Uh, let's see. From a national security perspective, exploitation is the holy grail of endeavors. It's critical to determine whether UAP technology could be reverse engineered and used to our benefit, but we can't exploit such technology unless we first understand it. Talks about the potential war rewards outweigh the risks. Um, there's always a risk when it comes to communicating national security issues to the public, but it's subjective. The significance of that risk depends on who you ask. If you ask a military leader, for example, they would say government secrecy about advanced aerospace phenomena is crucial because you want to avoid broadcasting your capabilities and intentions to your potential enemy. A politician with UAPs completely differently. They may ask, is this something for potential voters need to know or will concealing it cause my constituents to lose faith in me? How does this discussion affect the voters and my ability to represent them? A religious figure, on the other hand, would likely be more concerned with the religious and philosophical implications UAPs might have on his or her faith. There are countless examples throughout history of individuals challenging the prevailing system of power with radical scientific ideas. He goes on and gives the example of Galileo, uh, which is important. And then he, he concludes it, this section basically saying, as someone without political or religious agenda, I'm free to say that rewards outweigh the risks in this situation. He says how in December 2017, to the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, released the U.S. military footage of the UAPs and no government imploded and no religion dissolved which I think is a good point. Uh, and then the article goes on, and I, I want you to continue um, to read the rest of this. It's it's a well-written blog statement. Again, I think he's trying to gain our trust with this and get us on board with what he's saying. Um, my frustration here is he doesn't mention the common citizen. He's talking about religious authorities, political um, p political. Uh, officials, government, military leaders, but he's not addressing the average citizen, you and me. What about us? Forget all that other stuff. What about the truth seeker? What about the experiencer? And, and that is my frustration because it's as if we don't have the power. We don't have a say. We're not capable of handling the truth is what we keep hearing from people coming out of this organization. Anyway, I digress. 
I've spent uh, more time on this than I wanted to tonight, but I think it's important to break that down. I will have the links in the show notes for you to read the entire thing and draw your own conclusions. Quickly, I just want to draw your attention to, and I will have the video uh, linked in the show notes. From Unknown Country, they cover a story, Is This Nessie? Kids Take Some Strange Pictures. It's a brief article and some video footage of some strange phenomena on the uh, on the lake there out in Scotland, in, in uh, Loch Ness. So check that out. Let me know. Do you think it is, in fact, Nessie? All right. Let's talk some nanotech. Where to begin? I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, I received a video just today, and the video is, I'll have this linked in the show notes. The video is titled, uh, here we go, X nun exposes Jesuits and shares remedies, an urgent call to all Americans. Now, this was published on August 15, 2018. It was published by Sister Carrie Borner. Um, let's see. I, I don't know much about her. This is the first I've ever heard of her. Apparently, she was a nun for 14 years, and she ended up being, looks like, sexually abused by a priest in the Catholic Church. And she became a whistleblower, and she says things like the CIA is using certain aspects of the Catholic Church as a front for what sounds like mind control and all this other stuff. And some of the things she said does fit nicely with a lot of the conspiracy theories. I hate using that term, but a lot of the stuff that we talk about and cover here on the show. Now, let's face it. I, I try to stay away from this subject. I just It's just a rabbit hole. I just don't want to go down. But there are threads that lead to it. And sooner or later, we're going to have to look at it and address it and tie these pieces in. There's some stuff going on with the Catholic Church that we can't deny. There's a lot of, I know just in Pennsylvania, they, they just indicted uh, some bishops and some priests. I forget how many counts. It was, I think a couple hundred counts of sexual abuse being covered up by a lot of these priests who have just been moved around by the church. Um, there's something to it. Now, David Icke has talked about the pedophilia for a long time time, how it's running through the churches, how it's running through the secret societies, and he talks about how this ties into the the suffering that goes on with these children uh, is a food of energetic nourishment, if you listen to my Archon stuff, for these parasitic entities. They gain nourishment off of the energetic output of the suffering of these kids. So, now this nun, this uh, former nun, uh, Carrie Borner doesn't go into that aspect of it. But what she does talk about is nanotechnology being placed within our food system. Now, she says this goes back at least 50 years where the U.S. government has been working on this. She says this comes through with MK Ultra. I want you to listen to her video and her statements about this. Um, but she talks about uh, the founder of MK Ultra being a part of this and how this has impacted our food today as a form of mind control. But basically what happened was I attended this monastery for, for services and so forth and came to find out that basically the founder of it was the head of MK Ultra, Mind Control Ultra. His name is J. Peter Grace. Okay, so she has several links in her YouTube video and notes beneath it um, telling more of her story. In this video itself, it doesn't get into too much of how she knows this guy was from NK Ultra and running through you know this place that she was in. Um, I, I don't know that yet. I have not validated that, but it's an interesting thread that I think is worth exploring if you're looking for a point of research. Um, Look at the links that she has. I will have the main video with the links in my show notes for you to explore a little bit further. I've been sitting here for two hours going through this stuff. It's 11.15 on a Friday night. Uh, I, I just, I'm out of time. So I want to get what I can out to all of you um, and hopefully you can pull a little bit more into it. But that's where she starts with this was an MK Ultra project that has evolved. And she, you know, she says this goes back even to the Nazis. And I want to get you know on one of my many tangents here 
But if we if we think about, I was thinking today all week. I was thinking about this stuff, and this this is where I think intuition is important, and we got to recognize the subtle signals of things that are coming to us. Because I've had this in my head for a while that, and maybe I'm just seeing things that I, I'm I'm you know self fulfilling prophecy here. I know that our our ancient history is riddled with anomalies and UFO accounts and and other sky gods and space brothers and all that stuff. But it really seems that things got kicked in a high gear. Things started to change with the UFO sightings and encounters with, with Roswell. I'm not saying Roswell was the first report. We know that it wasn't. But things seemed to change in around the late 40s, early 50s. And this is you know, when the Nazi technology, right after World War II, the Nazis were dealing with UFO stuff, um, allegedly, something was happening in our world at that time. Now, those that have looked into the Nazi stuff, and Hitler says that he was working with a race of alien beings, and obviously they went down to Antarctica, and they fled to, uh, was it uh, Peru? Well, I'm sorry, or Chile, somewhere where, he, where he's at right now, uh, or, or was allegedly. But then the Antarctica thread ties into the modern day David Wilcox stuff with the uh, ruins that are allegedly being discovered. I'm saying allegedly it's not tonight a lot. I hate saying that word. But um, I, another side note, I just listened to a Jimmy Church interview over the last week with um, not Corey Good, Emery Smith, who's within that circle there. Um, and he's saying that the Antarctica stuff is slowly being released and it's getting ready to come out. So I, I don't know. But this is how all this stuff is kind of connected. You got Hitler, Nazis, aliens, Admiral Byrd, Operation High Jump, uh, fl- flash forward to David Wilcox's announcement of this civilization being discovered with John Kerry and John Glenn going down to see this stuff, which they were down there. And now Emory Smith is saying this stuff is coming out. I, I don't know. But my point is stuff was happening in the 40s and 50s and beyond. And, and MK Ultra later, which came out later, a little bit later, is still a piece of that. Now, the piece that I'm hanging on to, and I'm going to get into the nanotech in a minute, it really hit me hard, was when reading the day after Roswell, when Colonel Corso made the statement that he, he number one, he suspected that the quote-unquote aliens were some kind of android, some kind of, they were part of the ship he he. Uh, speculated that they were some kind of biological robots that were programmed to fly the, sh- fly the ship because these machine, biological machines could withstand travel through space where the human body wouldn't be able to. So he thinks that these creatures were engineered to handle space travel and space flight and limited food and, and all that stuff. But he also said the, the most fascinating thing were the computer chips. And he looked at modern day and how technology was evolving based on the computer chips that he put out there. And I've talked about this on other shows. And I want to say it again because it's it's in my head. And maybe it's not my own thoughts. Maybe, maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe it's my intuition. Maybe it's my higher self. Who knows? Maybe it's the Matrix or maybe it's nanotech that's messing with my brain. Either way, I have to say it. But what if those silicone chips were a Trojan horse. And I know I've talked about it. I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record. But what if they were a Trojan horse? Now, David Icke, in one of his talks, he says that before this Archon influence came and started messing with mankind, we were a heart-centered society. We were much more psychic and intuitive because we went through that heart chakra to connect with the universe. We had more empathy. We had more feeling and understanding of the world around us. And as I started to open up psychically, I realized that connection through my heart. I realized that possibility, that power, it's still there. It's still encoded within, I guess, within our DNA. I I, can't, I say that because I've heard it. Um, but I have experienced it, that it, that connection is something very real. There is something real there, and I think that connection is different from this AI interface that we're dealing with, from the, my computer and my smartphone seeming to 
read my mind. I think we're dealing with two different signals here. Now, David Icke talks about the Saturn moon matrix. If you haven't found that, Google that. It is well worth your time to listen to that. I, was that the lion sleeps no more? Or it was the one after that one. I mean, if you listen to his entire, all of his stuff, that his eight hour talks are well worth your time. I would listen to him in like 45 minute increments when I would drive to work as he pieces everything together. And that is what I think is so important when you're doing these studies. Some, you know, we all have our areas that we gravitate towards. It may be UFOs, it may be psychic phenomena, it might be ancient history, it might be politics, it might be religion. But when you start to get a grasp of all of it, you start to see how they're all pieces to a larger puzzle. So how the, it, and, and having studied terrorism for a little bit, what you do in a, in a well-organized terrorist organization is you have everything compartmentalized. So this team is going to handle logistics. They know they need to get these supplies and deliver them to this location. They don't know why. They don't know what's being built. They don't know who's building it. They don't know what the target is. You have other people who are gathering intelligence. You have other people who are your operatives. Yes, you have your command cell. You have your communication. You have all these different cells or these aspects of a cell one hand doesn't know what the other one's doing. Well, that's what's going on here with this stuff. And it, it sounds insane until you start sitting down and going, well, logically, this works. It actually works. It makes sense. So am I really that crazy? You just hear a piece of it, naysayer out there, and you think it sounds nuts. But listen to the whole thing. I'm on a tangent again, but I got I to gotta say it. You know, uh, Jesse Ventura, I was pretty upset with his show when he went after David Icke because he went for the kill shot. He says, I want to see this giant reptile. You have a lot of people out there. I bet you make a lot of money. And he just he just tried to discredit the man because what David Icke says, you take his most extreme stuff, it's a tough pill to swallow. But if you do the work, if you sit there and, and listen to David Icke walk you through his connections, it doesn't sound so crazy anymore. So you need to really, before you just dismiss something, listen to everything. So listening to what this YouTube video says, I got a lot of red flags going up. I don't know that I can trust what she's saying. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I don't know anything about her. I don't know her credentials. I don't know if she's telling the truth. I don't know the sources that she's given out. And she's saying some wild, wacky stuff. But some of the stuff she's saying fits with some of the stuff I'm saying. That doesn't mean I'm cherry picking. It means it's got my attention and it warrants further investigation to see if this is in fact true. And that's where hopefully some of you come in looking into this a little bit more. So I know I'm all over the place. I think it's connecting. Maybe it's not. Tell me if it's not. Tell me I'm nuts. She starts going on. And again, my connection, the thread I'm on here is Colonel Corso suspected that these silicon computer chips were intentionally seeded here on our planet. Why? I'm saying, well, maybe they're a Trojan horse. Because now, from that technology, according to Corso, who helped disseminate that, look where we are. From that time period, look how much has changed. What a computer used to take an entire room or entire buildings, that's how much space it would take up, now we have things that are thousands of times more powerful that fit in our pocket. It's getting smaller. Now, again, I'm going back to David Icke a lot here because he's been calling this out for years. And, his, you know, two years ago, three years ago, he was laying it out. He was going on this long tour saying, I got to get the word out. First, you get the handheld devices. Then the next step is move them to the wearables. I mean, the wearable tech. Now, how many of you out there have a, well, maybe not many of my listeners, but how many people out there have a Fitbit, have a smartwatch, the Apple watch? It, you know, it, it, it's getting more and more prevalent because carrying the phone around is getting annoying for people, I guess. He says, after they're addicted to the wearables, then you get the implantables, the tech that you're able to implant in your body um, and they're starting to see that, the subdermal stuff, not just the microchips, but things you can put in underneath your skin that will do the same things that, that your cell phone does. 
So this is actually happening. The technology is continuing to get smaller. Let's go into nanotech. Let's tie it in again. I know I'm a broken record here. Elon Musk and Neuralink. He's working on developing a computer-to-brain interface. Ray, excuse me, Ray Kurzweil of Google, a futurist. Lots of great predictions. I covered him a few shows ago. He's talking about something similar, merging the mind with the cloud. Okay, so that is coming. Nanotechnology is continuing to develop. Now, a thread I haven't had a chance to explore, but it, I believe ties into this subject, are chemtrails. Is there nanotech being dispersed into the sky? Which brings me to what this woman is saying. There's nanotech in our food. That's in this YouTube video. She's claiming that nanotechnology is contained within our food. And she shares a document that she found. Now, in my opinion, this document is highly suspect. So I want to be quite clear about that. I have the links with a copy of the document. Um, I'm going to share some of it tonight on the show, but I think it's highly suspect. We need to validate, is this in fact an authentic document? I'm going to say no, it's not. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but what this document says, let me pull it up here. Where is it? Not that one. Is it this one? Yes. All right. So this document, it's called DTFN Estimates for Nano Domestic Quell Phase 4 Updated Compliance. And it's got a DOD 5880.9 doc op number 8 classified document. It has some initials on the bottom. It has a number. It's dated June 2013. It has a Department of Defense United States of America seal on the front of it. But the seal looks kind of I don't know. It doesn't look very good. Um, my first red flag with this is at the top it says number eight classified document, but it doesn't have the classification on the document. So when a document is classified, it should have the classification on there. I, I've had training through the government with this. This was, you know, Intelligence 101. You learn how to classify documents. You learn how to label and identify classified documents. I don't see any classification markings on these at all. Uh, it's only two pages that have been shared. The next page says at the very bottom, page one, approved for release. Well, I would think it should at least still say unclassified on there or classified slash approved for release. But what this talks about is projected, in, it says projected infection for general U.S. populace by January 2014 is estimated to reach 98% total infection for ages 18 and above may reach 99% DTFN projects dispersal mediums will require additional resources for phase four of NDQ DTFN recommends an increase in the following medium inflows and outflows specific to liquid dispersal. And it names Pepsi, Nestle, Chicago Municipal, Atlanta Municipal, uh, Dannon, Coca-Cola, Los Angeles Municipal, and Seattle Municipal. And it talks about, it's, I guess it's inferring that this is nanotechnology. Here's the thing. I don't, I, like, are they that stupid? Come on. They're going to name these companies that have, these companies would never go for that, that release, first of all, if they even had knowledge that stuff was in there, that they have nanotechnology that's going to go in your body and change your DNA and turn you into a, a cyborg for mind control. This would never be approved for release. I, I'm sorry. This is, this is Armageddon level stuff here. All right. So, I think this document is a hoax. I really do for so many reasons. But it inspired some thought in me. And, and this video, she shared some other links. One of the links was a website called uh, organicconsumers.org. And there was a article written this September 1st, 2009, nanotechnology offers disturbing parallels to GMOs. It says nanotechnology is the creation and manipulation of tiny objects at the level of molecules and atoms. According to Kantha Sheik, PhD, nanotechnology is, quote, the art and science of building stuff that does, that does stuff at the nanometer scale. It talks about a nanometer being one billionth of a meter or one hundred thousandth of a diameter of a human hair. Imagine comparing the size of a marble to the size of the earth. Uh, it goes on to the applications. I'm skipping around here. 
Scientists are applying nanotechnology to a wide range of industries, including food, food packaging, kitchenware, personal care, medicine, electronics, clothing, sports equipment, fertilizers, and pesticides. There are more than 800 consumer products on the market made using nanotechnology. A tableware set contains a nano silver coating that kills bacteria, aiming to prevent foodborne disease. A toothpaste contains nanoparticles that help remove plaque and provide minerals to protect against tooth decay. A golf club shaft is made from nano composite technology to be stronger and lighter weight. Um, let's see here. So it, it goes on. It, I don't see any links supporting it. Uh, let me let me scroll down here. All right, at the bottom it has some additional sources, but to back up the facts that they're saying in here, I I, I don't see that. Um, not that what they're saying isn't true. Let me go on here and see what else I can read. Uh, like genetically modified foods, products of nanotechnology pose risks to human health and the environment. Nano nano uh, particles are more chemically reactive than larger particles because they are so small they have greater access to the human body than larger particles. They can be inhaled, penetrate skin, gain access to tissues and cells, and cross the blood-brain barrier. That, I believe, is true. Uh, assessing the risk of nanotechnology is lagging far behind. The, there is vitally no data on chronic long-term effects on people, other organisms, or the wider environment, wrote British scientist John Lalto, author of a report from the Royal Commission of Environmental Pollution. All right, so I want you to go on and read the rest of this article. I'll have it linked in the show notes, and it'll be in the Seeker newsletter. Um, this woman had another link that she shared from NewScientist.com, dated October 21st, 2015. This one's called Carbon Nanotubes Found in Children's Lungs for the First Time, and it goes on talking about a study in Paris showed that they found these carbon nanotubes in the lungs of children and people with asthma may be even more particularly vulnerable to have these carbon nanotubes in them. I guess something to do with their defenses being down because of the um, asthma. Now, I, I thought, okay, this is interesting. And then they had, they did have a caution to this article. I'm going to read the caution. And it's kind of saying, let's be careful before we go crazy over this article. It says, James Bonner at North Carolina State University in Raleigh says that the detection of nanotubes should be treated with caution as other studies of air pollution over the years have failed to find them. In my opinion, there is a great deal of uncertainty as to what these structures really are, especially the materials in the lung cells from patients, he says. As for the potential health effects, Jonathan Grigg at Queen Mary University of London thinks nanotubes are unlikely to have the cancer-causing potential of asbestos fibers, which are much larger and can get trapped in the lining of the lung. All right, so there's your kind of your balancing statement there. That doesn't mean they're not affecting us. It doesn't mean, you know, that they can't have harmful effects. I have no idea what a carbon nanotube is, so I Googled it. There we go, using the AI to, to you know, uh, identify AI. First thing that came up was a Wikipedia statement. I don't use Wikipedia as a source, but I actually did like the description that they give in the little, the little blurb here in the Google search window, so I want to read it but it's Wikipedia. You take that with, for what it's worth. Carbon nanotubes are allotropes of carbon with a cylindrical nanostructure. These cylindrical carbon molecules have unusual properties which are valuable for nanotechnology, electronics, optics, and other fields of materials, science, and technology. Okay, so I, I did a little bit more digging, and I went to understandingnano.com. What are carbon nanotubes? A significant nanoparticle discovery that came to light in 1991 was carbon nanotubes. Where buckyballs are round, nanotubes are cylinders. They haven't, they haven't folded around to create a sphere. Carbon nanotubes are composed of carbon atoms linked in a hexagonal shape, hexagonal shape, excuse me, with each carbon atom covalently bonded to three other carbon atoms. Carbon nanotubes have diameters as small as one nanometer and lengths up to several centimeters. Although, like buckyballs, carbon nanotubes are strong, they are not brittle. They can be bent, and when released, they will spring back to their original shape. And it goes on to talk a little bit more about carbon nanotubes and what they can look at. This is an excerpt from Nanotechnology for Dummies, second edition from Wiley Publishing. A little bit more digging. Uh, carbon nan This is from science.sciencemag.org. Carbon nanotubes, present and future commercial applications. I'm just going to read the abstract here. Worldwide commercial interest in carbon nanotubes is reflected in a production capacity that presently exceeds several thousand tons per year. 
Currently, bulk CNT powders are incorporated in diverse commercial products ranging from rechargeable batteries, automotive parts and sporting goods, to boat hulls and water filters. Advances in CNT synthesis, purification, and chemical modification are enabling integration of CNTs in a thin film electronics and large area coatings. Although not yet providing compelling mechanical strength or electrical or thermal con uh, conductivities for many applications, CNT yarns and sheets already have promising performance for applications including supercapacitors, actuators, and lightweight electromagnetic shields. There we are with electromagnetism again. Okay, My point in sharing this is, number one, I had no idea what a uh, carbon nanotube was. It is, in fact, sounds like something that's engineered for the purpose of nanotechnology. It is not biology. So this one report says they're turning up into the lungs of kids. What does this mean? Now, I'm not saying the carbon nanotubes are the same stuff that they're saying is in our food, that this woman's saying in our food. More research is needed for this. At least on my end. I, I don't know. But look at... I mean, we've got GMOs out there. We already know they're genetically modifying food. We've got chemtrails out there. I'm making a leap right here, but let's take that leap for a second. So let's say that AI, you know, you've got Dr. Greer. He's saying that the aliens are friendly and they have the capability to destroy us, but they haven't. So they must be our friends. And then you've got Elizondo saying, I don't know if they're friendly or not. I'm going to assume they're a threat until proven otherwise. Colonel Corso saying basically that these chips were seeded here. We look at how our world is evolving, how addicted we're becoming to technology. We've got 5G coming online. It's going to be everywhere. I just had a smart meter installed on my home. David Icke talks about uh, well, he covers what's known as the woodpecker signal. That's relevant. Look into that. It's how they were using our lighting system to gather or to, to influence your thoughts, you know, sending information through your lights. The Internet of Things, everything is gathering data. I've talked about the AI. Everything's getting connected, how they're gathering all this data, sending it to your smartphone, sending it to your smartwatch. Well, what's the ultimate goal? Is it social control? Is it the Archon feeding frenzy? Is it a combination? Is this an Orwellian 1984? I mean, I, I, my fear with this AI and the merging with the cloud is that, yes, they're going to sell like it's this beautiful utopia. It's this great thing for us. We can live forever. We can go experience anything that we want. Yes, that sounds wonderful. But, yep, AI's gotcha. Is it possible? that the food we're eating is so badly riddled with this nanotech that we are all infected with this. I, I, again, I think this is a phony report here. I'll, I'll share it. You can decide too. That doesn't mean it's not true though. That, 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 mean, that doesn't mean that that's not possible that we have this nanotech in us. We're seeing this evolution. And I, 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 I suspect that These, I wonder, I don't, is it related? Demons are connected to the archons who feed off of us, who are trying to gain access to the physical world. That's why possession happens. So maybe these nanotechnological parts change our body chemistry in some way that allows this AI signal to come and inhabit our bodies a lot easier than the spiritual heart-based signal that may only be a temporary thing. Again, I think we're dealing with two signals here. I think the heart-based signal has been severely muffled and jammed. Some of us are able to break through it, but I think, I, I think, and and Bob Monroe talked about all the noise when he would leave his body. That you know, he called it the M-band noise up in the atmosphere. Is that this distracting signal that keeps us keeps us? Uh, our focus away from our ability to connect into this stuff, I don't know. But it's another piece that I think is relevant and connects. You've got talk, flat earthers talk. At the, the very first show I did when I revamped this show was called The World, the world is Flat. And, and the thing I said was, well, I don't think the world is flat, but they do uncover a lot of anomalies that I think are relevant to a lot of our truth seekers out there. They talk about the firmament. 
Well, you know, and again, I go back to Michael Tessarian stuff, talking about this electronic prison that was put around the planet. I think, I think uh, Robert Morning's guy talks about that in his talks as well, in, in the Terror Papers. The Bible talks about the firmament, the waters above the waters. Is there some kind of electromagnetic signal trapping us here? Maybe that trap is that signal that blocks our, our full psychic intuitive potential unless we can really work to break through that through meditation. I struggle with that with my meditation. Maybe it feeds us these counter signals and, and distracts our minds. It's not easy to break through. That's why I think that getting involved with merging with computers and linking with nanotech is taking us to a deeper level of the prison. So let's let's just big biggest tinfoil hat you have. I'm putting it on right now. Let's say Corso was right. Let's say Roswell really happened. Let's say these chips were there to seed for some reason. And this is a Trojan horse. Do you want to have an Independence Day style invasion where you kill off most of the populace and you destroy most of your crop? Or do you want to remain hidden as if you don't exist? Infiltrate their government, infiltrate their corporations and convince them that they want your product, which will serve as a backdoor, giving them unlimited access to the crop they desire. I say it all the time, it's the consumer that's driving this technology. Which invasion is more beneficial, is more lucrative the invasion where we know we have an enemy and we need to search for a way to fight it and prevent it and counteract it or the invasion where we don't even know we've been invaded until it's too late. That is some scary stuff. And I know it sounds wild, but what if, what if I'm right? You know, I, I looked at some of the Morgellon stuff I don't know what it is, and I, something I do want to try, it's the video where they take the isopropyl alcohol, they put it in a bowl, and then they throw some grape juice in their mouth, they switch it around, and they spit it out, and then you see these little worm things moving around from what they spit out in their mouth, and what they're saying is that's, that's the nanofibers that are reacting to the change in the pH between the grape juice, your saliva, and the uh, isopropyl alcohol. So that's an experiment I do want to try at some point. Um, if you try it, Please send me a video of it. Let, let's. Do we have these fibers in us? So I don't. I don't know at this point. But it is concerning. Um, that's why. Again, I think right now our best defense is to continue to do the inner work. We need to tag our remote viewing teams. We need to build our remote viewing teams use them to gather information. We need to develop our intuitive skills, our intuition, so we can recognize these foreign signals uh, that are not our own, that may be infiltrating us and manipulating us and using us. I want to come back to the point I also made uh, a few weeks ago. I tied into Courtney Brown's book. He did a remote viewing session, Remote Viewing Jesus, and what he said was, during the, the data that Courtney Brown gathered, and he's a remote viewer I respect, I think he has trustworthy and valuable data. He said that this is by design. The CDC was dealing with an outbreak. It didn't know where it came from. It didn't know what it was, but this was by design in order to force, I think, human evolution or hu this change in humanity. And what I speculated was, could this be some kind of disease that comes out that is then forcing us to, to upload to the cloud as the only means to survive, only means for our consciousness to survive. I, I was reading in this, these threads that I'm going through tonight, one of the things they said was that with this nanotechnology inside us, they'll be able to activate it in ways to make us ill. It'll seem like some unknown flu where there's no cure for it, and it's going to be activated through 
either radio frequencies or through drone technology or through Wi-Fi. Again, I don't have evidence other than other people speculating and going on their own tangents. I will share all this with you, but it, it fits. And the remote viewing data, again, I think, it, you know, I, I take that a little bit more seriously than just these things I'm finding on the internet, internet speculating it. But what if? That's all I can say is what if. So I talked about some scary stuff tonight. Um, I'm not trying to scare you. I need to get this out just for me to try to process it. You know, as, as I do the show, that's how I process some of this information as I'm getting it out there. Um, I want to hear your feedback, but more importantly, um, we need to figure out a way that we can counteract this. Now, um, from some of the things I've read, there's heavy metal detoxes that you can do, which is just good for you to do for your body anyway at times. Um, so I would, and this is something I want to do too, look into different types of cleanses that you can safely do for your body and hopefully purge a lot of this stuff out. Parasite cleanses and heavy metal detoxes, I think, I think would be a starting point. Um, again, in your meditations, I, I read another person talking about this stuff, um, was saying, you know, focus on strengthening your heart chakra and, and flooding green light through that because that creates a frequency that the, these, what he was calling demons, um, don't like. So I believe that there are things that we can do, but we first need to be aware of it. Like I said, this could be a Trojan horse. So we're, oh, look at this great horse that is a gift from from the Trojans. We're going to bring it in, which is what we've all done. You know, I, I don't know. Be aware. Be mindful. Don't panic. Don't be afraid. We have the power to find solutions to it. It just takes a little bit of work and effort. Here I am. It's 11.45 on a Friday night. I've been up since 5.30 this morning. I got to get up early tomorrow morning and do it all again. But that's the fight right now. I don't even want to call it a fight. Let's call it the dance. Fight promotes fear and conflict, and we're just trying to ride the wave here, my friends. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end the show here. We're just about an hour in duration. Um, I want to say thank you to Ray Davis for his uh, introductory piece that he put out there. Um, I think it's very thought-provoking, very motivating, very inspiring, as always. I want to direct you to sixcentsmedia.net. Check out the latest articles and blog posts and videos that, that Ray and myself have been putting out, mostly Ray. Um, I do have some guest bloggers that I'm working on getting up there as well. Um, if you'd like to contribute to the platform, we've got a platform for you. That's why we're doing this. Um, you, you know, and it's mutually beneficial. We're getting content and you're getting a platform to put your content out there on. We're sharing your content and we're hoping that you're going to turn around and share our content. We're, you know, quid pro quo. We're trying to grow this. Um, so please let me know if you have something that you think is worth sharing in a blog, in a YouTube video, whatever it is, let us know. We want to get it up there. We want to develop a platform where we can all grow and benefit together. There's strength in numbers. If you haven't done so yet, please sign up for the secret newsletter. You will get my free ebook, I Am Human and We Are Not Who We Think We Are. Last week, I read the beautiful review, the beautifully glowing review from my friend Deborah um, talking about that book in exploring who are we and what's going on with this archontic influence. I think we need to ask those questions. If you really stop and, and ask yourself, who are we? You're going to be surprised at what the answers are. Who are we? What is God? Why is there suffering in this world? Those are the threads that I explore, and I think they're important to, to ask if you really want to understand this reality. So check it out, sixcentsmedia.net slash I am human, all one word. It's all free. You get to read I am human, and we are not who we think we are for free. You get the free secret newsletter, with, and you'll get access to the podcast and all the archives. I think this is episode 158, 159, so a ton of free content out there through sixcentsmedia.net. Lastly, if you have a product and you'd like to sponsor the show, we need your help. There's a, like I said, there's a ton of content. There's a ton of space. We're starting to get, we've got consistent hits and views and, and listens. It's a great place to, uh, to showcase your product. I promise I won't let you down, but uh, we need your help. Support the show. All right, friends, I'm out of time. I've got a great guest in the works, hopefully for next week. That's all I'm going to say. I'm, I'm trying to get him on here for next week. Big guest, big guest. That's all I want to say. Uh, so come back. 
And have a great week, my friends. I'm Dennis Snappy II. This has been another episode of The Secret Podcast, where small changes among the masses can have a massive impact around the world. I encourage you to be that change. Never stop questioning. Keep open mind. Thank you.